Good evening. Tonight's lecture is Coming to America. Now, I've been asked a couple of times, it's set in, the title sounds familiar, reminds of people of Neil Diamond, and I said really Neil Diamond was my inspiration for the, the, the title, at least, of tonight's lecture, because, of course, the title to Coming to America was from Neil Diamond's uh, famous song, which was in the Jazz Singer, which he personally wrote, and the Jazz Singer, to some extent, really is a story of a large percent of American Jewry. Of course, in The Jazz Singer, you have a child, an Eastern European immigrant, whose father is a chazan, whose father is a cantor, and he, he starts out in the, in the Alter Heim, in the old country, and this child get, lives the American dream, gets intermarried, but at the end of the day, he still wants to be chazan himself and daven for the Omer. Coming to America, unfortunately, for much of American Jewish history, was exactly that story. But before we get to the United States of America, the history of the Jews in the Americas begin over 250 years before the United States was an independent country. <clears throat> Anyone who has attended this lecture will know that it is not an accident that Christopher Columbus sailed from Palos on August the 3rd 1492, the same day, he was scheduled the same day, he got del delayed by several hours, as Tisha B'Av that year. And of course, on August the 3rd, 1492, was the last day of the expulsion of Spain for the remainder of the Jews who had stayed in Spain. <coughs> and Don Yitzhak of Arbanel, the great Jewish statesman, great um, author of works on, on Tanakh, led 80,000 Jews out, out of Spain. Now, the reign of terror and the Inquisition would start in Spain with full force. But the interesting thing is, it was the same day that Columbus left. So six centuries of vibrant, fruitful Spanish existence for Jews in the Spanish, con the Spanish country ended. And on that exact same day, Christopher Columbus set sail for the New World. And in that new world, which would be the Americas, it would change not only the Jewish world, but the new world of the Americas would change Europe and the world at large. On Christopher Columbus's original boat, there were at least seven Jews, new Christians, Jew people who had been forcibly converted or converted under duress or due to financial gains on that boat including Rodrigo de, Tri de, de, de Triana, who was the first to sight land, Maestri Bernal, who was a doctor on the boat, and Louis de Torres, perhaps the most famous, who was an interpreter who spoke Hebrew, who was specifically asked to come onto the boat because when Columbus went traveling, they thought perhaps they would meet on the other side of the world the ten lost tribes, and they need to speak Hebrew. <laughs> In the coming years, New Christians who were running out of Spain and Portugal heavily settled the Americas. By the 16th century, there were fully functioning Jewish communities in the Dutch and English colonies of, at the time, Dutch and English colonies of Brazil, Suriname, Caracas, Haiti, Dominican Republic, Jamaica, and Barbados. In addition, there were unorganized, furtive Jewish communities of Moranos in the Spanish and Portuguese territories, especially in Mexico, where, this, where the Spanish government had to make a rule that no Spanish citizen who would not, could not go back four generations being Catholic could come to Mexico at the time because there's so many quote unquote new Christians, Jew, people of Jewish extraction, were there many of them who were coming out in the open. So much so that even in the beginning, during the conquering of Mexico in 1519, the Ber Bernal Diaz de Castello writes, that conquistador Hernando Cortes, who was famous for conquering Mexico, killed several Spanish soldiers who were secret Jews. In North America, the first known Jew to come onto the North American continent <coughs> to live was Shlomo Franco, Salman Franco, a merchant who arrived in Boston in 1649. 
Mr. Frankel was not able to stay in, Bar in Boston. He was given a stipend from the Puritans there on condition he take the next boat back to Holland. As far as North America really begins in 1644, with the arrival in New Amsterdam, later to be known as New York, or as Jesse Jackson once said, New York, um, of 23 Jewish refugees from Recife, Brazil. The Dutch had Brazil as a, as a possession, but when the Portuguese reconquered Brazil from the Dutch, um, these Jews were immediately part of the Inquisition and they ran. They came to New Amsterdam, which is still the Dutch, and a famous governor, there's parts of New York named after him, Peter Stuyvesant, was the governor, and he wanted to chase them out. He, this is what he actually said about them. He called the Jews repugnant, deceitful, and enemies and blasphemers of Christ. And St St Peter Stuyvesant actually requested from the Dutch West Indian Company to let them not be, ba to bar them essentially from New Amsterdam. New Amsterdam officially was pluralistic, and he asked to, to bar them. There are historians who claim that Stuyvesant was actually um, trying to get statues in the Dutch Reformed Church, which is hard to believe because. Uh, the Netherlands, as mentioned previously, is probably the most open country to Jews uh, of the time. The famous Menachem in Israel is there. They had a very strong community in Amsterdam. But be that as it may, his request was denied, especially because the Dutch, Dutch West Indies Company was heavily funded by Jews. So <coughs> that began the Jewish settlement in North America. And religious tolerance soon followed. And the first place it went was South Carolina, who in 1669, their charter was written by a little-known Englishman at the time, but by our time, we very known John Locke, who wrote their charter and explicitly said that Jews, heathens, and dissenters are welcome to come to South Carolina. And it is not surprising that the largest city until the 1830s was Charleston, South Carolina, which maxed at 600 Jews. The Sephardic Dutch Jews were also the early settlers of Newport, where the country's oldest surviving uh, build, synagogue building stands, Savannah, Philadelphia, and Baltimore. In New York City, Sherith Israel, you can ask Mrs. Linda Mountain, her family, though they came from Iraq, they joined that synagogue, she was very fond of it, um, which is the oldest continuous congregation started in 1687 <laughs> and had their synagogue erected in 1728. If you visit shared in Israel today, it's also called the Spanish-Portuguese Synagogue. You can see artifacts from the original synagogue, which was built in 1728. However, colonial Jewry as a whole lacked an ethos of Jewish learning, of schooling, and religious identification. There were rabbis who were brought over from Europe, but within two to three generations, almost completely these Jews had assimilated. You don't meet Sephardic Jews from these, these Dutch Portuguese backgrounds in America. And had you lived 100 years ago, you would not have met them because by 100 years ago, they were not a lot, no longer Jewish. This, from the beginning, would highlight a continual problem of American Jewry. Not like the old world experience of anti-Semitism, but rather assimilation. The story of much of the American Jewish experience would be a success story of integration, but a dismal failure to maintain Jewish identity, let alone build Torah institutions and Torah communities like you can see at least in the past 40, 50 years. And as a whole, American Jewry has been a dismal failure, if you look at the history which we'll discuss tonight, as far as Judaism. But going back, and some of this I actually got from Ken Spiro's uh, excellent book called World Perfect, it's a good book to get, the Torah's influence on the Puritans, which really set the tone for the Jews coming to America. The creation of the United States of America was a unique event in the history of the world. We started a country, a republic, from scratch. And who were the majority of the original founders of this republic? M many of them in the Northeast were Puritans, and the other parts of them are Mennonites and other minorities who were persecuted. And the Puritans view their immigration from England, if you read any of their literature, 
as literally a virtual reenactment of the Jewish exodus from Egypt. To them, England was Egypt. The Atlantic Ocean was the Red Sea. And the Puritans were the new Israelites. And they came to, have you ever seen the, some of the names of the cities here? Canaan, the Promised Land. Oh, the, the miracle was the Promised Land for the Puritans. Thanksgiving, if you read, this is why some Orthodox Jews actually do not celebrate Thanksgiving, because the origins of Thanksgiving were completely Christian in nature, and it was supposed to be like a Day of Atonement. We literally considered it a Day of Atonement in 1621, the first Thanksgiving. Look at source number one. This is Gabriel Sivan in the Bible and Civilization. <coughs> No Christian community in history has identified more <coughs> with the people of the book than did the early settlers in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, who believed their own lives to be a literal reenactment of the biblical dra drama of the Hebrew nation. These emigre Puritans dramatized their own situation as the righteous remnant of the church corrupted by the Babylonian woe and saw themselves as instruments of divine providence, a people chosen to build a new commonwealth on the covenant entered into Mount Sinai. When the Puritans actually during Cromwell had its brief period of ruling Egypt, uh, of England, <laughs> of England, there were amongst the extreme groups of, 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 of the Puritans who literally wanted to take away English common law and put biblical <laughs> biblical law as the law of the land of England. The Puritans were heavily focused on what they would call the Old Testament, we'll call the Jewish Bible. The earliest legislation of New England was determined by scripture. At the first assembly of New Haven, I'm sure you didn't know this, in 1639, co-founder of New Haven, John Davenport, clearly stated the primacy of the Bible as the legal and moral foundation of the colony. This is a quote from Davenport's original speech. Scriptures do hold forth a perfect rule for the direction and government of all men in all duties, which they are to perform to God and men, as well as in the government, families, and commonwealth, as in matters of the church. The word of God shall be the only rule to be attended unto in organizing the affairs of government in this plantation. Can you imagine if some of the candidates said that in the presidential <laughs> race right now. I can't imagine what happened. <laughs> Subsequently, in New Haven, the legislators adopted the Code of 1655, which contains 79 statutes, half of which, half of the actual statutes of the colony of New Haven contained biblical references, virtually all from the Hebrew Bible. The Plymouth Colony <coughs> had a similar code of law as Massachusetts Assembly, which is called the Capital Laws of New England, also primarily based on the Hebrew Bible. Of course, the Puritans didn't have an oral law, they didn't have a Talmud, so they interpreted many things literally and incorrectly. Jew the Judaism and the Bible and Hebrew played a profound influence on higher education as well. If you look at the various editions, Harvard, Yale, William and Mary, Rutgers, Princeton, Browns, King's College, now known as Columbia, Johns Hopkins, Dartmouth, and of course the famous University of Pennsylvania. Many of these colleges adopted some Hebrew or word phrase as part of their official emblem or seal. Anyone from New Haven will know this, but if you look at Yale's emblem, under the Latin lux et veritas, the Yale has an urmbetumim with the words in Hebrew. Look at Yale's symbol, urmbetumim. Dartmouth, Columbia, has, a, has the Hebrew name of God at the top of the center, with the Hebrew name for one of the angels on the banner towards the middle. And Dartmouth has the words God Almighty on their banner. It's till this day, all these colleges. So popular was the Hebrew language in the United States of America, in, in America, in the 16th and 17th centuries, that many students at Yale and other universities, their commencement addresses were delivered in Hebrew. This is way before Eliezer ben Yehuda. Okay, Harvard, Yale, Columbia, Brown, Princeton, Johns Hopkins, and the famous University of Pennsylvania, all taught courses in Hebrew, which was remarkable, which was remarkable because there was no university in England at the time that had a course in Hebrew. Hebrew was so important at the time that there were amongst the early founding fathers 
individuals, especially when they revolted against England in the beginning, who wanted to drop English as the land of the, of the tongue of the country and adopt Hebrew as the official language of the United States of America. They were outvoted. Mostly because not that many people of the masses, the higher education was speaking Hebrew, the common man did not. Jewish symbolism in America. If you looked at the first um, banners that they had, it was just always a struggle of the ancient Hebrews against the wicked parrot. The first design, this is remarkable, the first design for the seal of the United States of America, recommended by Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, and Thomas Jefferson in 1776, depicts the Jews crossing the Red Sea, and the motto of the seal read, Resistance to tyrants is obedience to God. That was the first, one of the first propositions for the motto and the seal of the United States of America. Of course, for those from Philadelphia, the inscription of the Liberty Bell is from Yoruval, from the Jubilee, Leviticus 25.10. Proclaim liberty throughout the land unto all the inhabitants. The Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, uh, they are, are among our life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Now, of course, a lot of those ideas are Enlightenment ideas, but the idea of a creator is certainly biblical in nature. Eventually, of course, the United States of America, its motto on the coins and currency is in God we trust. That came later in 1864, and it was officially passed by Congress in 1956, largely because the country was concerned about the godless communists. So in 1956, they actually legislated it that you be part of uh, the, the, the currency. Thus, the Puritan background and the fact that America had been a haven for persecuted minorities made the United States fertile ground for a more welcoming country to the Jews. And by 1776, in the War of Independence, there were around 2,000 Jews in the United States of America out of a population of 2.5 million. However, they paid, played a disproportional role in the American Revolution. Almost all of the, the Charleston men participated on the side of Washington. Of course, the country was almost evenly split. People forget that, that when the revolution started in the beginning, the country was pretty well, pretty evenly divided. There were many loyalists to England. <clears throat> the first Jew to die was Francis Salvador of Georgia. But perhaps most famous and most instrumental was Chaim Solomon, who was the most important financier for the Americans at the end of the war. Look at source number two. This is from the congressional record of March 25th, 1975, in preparations for the 200th anniversary of the United States of America, of course, in 1976. There are lots of things going on, and they start to prepare. This is the congressional record. Now, when Morris, who was, <coughs> the support, was appointed the superintendent of finance, he turned to Solomon for help in raising the money needed to carry on the war and later to save the emerging nation from financial collapse. Solomon advanced direct loans to the government and also gave generously of his own resources to pay the salaries of government officials and army officers. <coughs> with frequent entries of, I sent for Chaim Solomon, Morris's diary from the years 1781 to 1784 records some 75 transactions between the two men. Solomon, of course, was heavily involved in Jewish community. He was, he was the largest donor to Congregation Mikveh Israel, which is still standing in downtown Philadelphia. He was the primary person for rescinding the Pennsylvania Council of Censors religious test oath in Pennsylvania, to hold office in uh, Pennsylvania. In 1893, a bill was presented before the 52nd United States Congress ordering a gold medal to be struck in his recognition. Howard Fast wrote a famous book in 1941 um, called Chaim Solomon, Son of Liberty. Anyone who lived or has been to Chicago, at least the main areas, those are one of the most famous statues in this country in most history books, is that on the Wacker Drive in downtown Chicago, a famous statue of George Washington, Chaim Solomon, and Robert Morris, who is the, the, those three individuals, in 1975, also in preparation for 1976, a special stamp was made for Chaim Solomon. And the stamp st stated, financial hero, businessman, and broker, Chaim Solomon was responsible for raising most of the money needed to finance the American Revolution and later to save the nation 
from collapse. In World War II, one of the United States Liberty ships was named the SS Chaim Salman. He was instrumental in financing the American Revolution. As a result, after the war, anyone who visits the synagogue in Newport, I've been there, it's a good place to visit, the Turo Synagogue, they have the, the original letter or a copy of it or, 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 or inscribed. So it says George Washington wrote a, 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 a letter to the congregation in Newport saying as follows, May the children of the stock of Abraham, who dwell in the land, continue to merit and enjoy the goodwill of the other inhabitants. Well, everyone shall sit safely under his own vine and fig tree, and there shall be none to make him afraid. I hope everyone knows where that verse is from. That's actually from a verse in Micha, describing the Messianic times, again illustrating how biblical the original founding fathers were. But Washington's letter from the beginning of the United States of America sets a tone. Jews are welcome. Jews can come here. This is a country where you can sit under your own fig vine. And by 1790 to 2,500 Jews in America at the time did face some legal restrictions, but Delaware, Pennsylvania, South Carolina, and Georgia had, had eliminated any barriers completely, as did the Bill of Rights. So the four states which had the most Jews at the time had complete freedom for Jews, and most other states followed, with the last four states being Rhode Island in 1842, North Carolina in 1868, and the last state was New Hampshire in 1877 had any restrictions on Jews. And even these restrictions were not really heavily um, uh, enforced. In fact, there were so few Jews in the country, it was very hard to keep uh, tabs. In the 19th century, by 1820, there were only 6,000 Jews in America, but that would soon change. Starting in the 1830s, reform Jews from Germany <coughs> started to come to this country. These German Jews were not too Jewish. They were either reformed Jews, who had dropped the basic tenets of traditional Judaism, or they were enlightened secular Jews. And by 1850, there were 17,000 German Jews in the country, and by 1880, there were 270,000 German Jewish residents of the United States of America who would set the tone for the country. Early examples of, of, their, of their coming was they set up a, a, an orphanage in Charleston. The first Jewish school was in, in, in New York. And in 1843, they fa founded the first national secular Jewish organization, also known as B'nai B'rit. Most of these New York Jews, most of these German Jews, moved to New York. By 1880, New York had a Jewish population of 180,000, by far being the largest Jewish city before the mass immigrations that would come soon. Of course, New York would increase tenfold, New York City, to 1.8 million by the 1970s. But in 1880, it already had uh, 180,000. What about during the Civil War? During the Civil War, there were approximately 3,000 Jews. There were 150,000 Jews in the country at the time. 3,000 Jews on the Confederate side, 7,000 Jews on the... Um, Union side. They played leadership on both sides. There were nine Jewish generals, 21 Jewish colonels, colonels in the world. Or the most famous Jew was Judah Benjamin, or infamous Jew, I should say, who was the head of the treasury for the Confederacy. He was an intermarried, a similar Jew who actually was embarrassed about his Judaism, but a Jew nonetheless. After the war, he fled to England, where all criminals fled. <laughs> uh, but there were several Jewish bankers. There were several Jewish bankers on both sides, the Seligman family and the Spire family for the, for the Union and the Emil L. L. Erlinger and Company for the Confederacy. But in the Civil War, perhaps the first real strong anti-Semitic feeling came. And that was during uh, when there was major tensions, there were, of course, in the Civil War, major tensions about, about race and immigration. And both sides at one point, the Confederacy and the Union, of course, the Jews are always brokers, they're in business, and they blame the Jews for helping the other side. And General Ulysses S. Grant took this literally, and he, he gave the famous or infamous General Order Number 11, which said that any Jew in his area, which was in Tennessee, had to abandon immediately. And he said as follows, the Jews are, as a class, 
are violating every regulation of trade established by the Treasury Department and also Department orders are hereby expelled within 24 hours from the receipt of this order. The order was in a short time rescinded by President Abe Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln. However, in the meet interim, until Lincoln found out, there were Jews who actually were expelled in Tennessee. In the election of 1868, this became a contentious issue when Reform clergyman Isaac Weiss, who was a famous Democrat as well, actually campaigned against Grant based on order, not general order number 11. Grant denied that he really had any animus towards the Jews. He just said, he actually wrote in a, a letter, uh, he did not pretend to sustain the order, the order was issued, and said without any reflection, without thinking of the Jews as a set, uh, or raised to themselves, but simply as persons who had successfully violated an order. He held that were, they were violating the order. Grant actually won the Jewish vote of 1868. For the record, most German Jews in the 19th century were Republican. Right? They were conservative, they were upward, upward mobile, and they were Republican. It would change with Eastern European Jews radically to their Democrat side by the 1920s. Grant himself tried to reconcile, and 12 years later, after that order, when he was the second term of presidency in 1874, Grant himself and his entire cabinet went to the dedication of Addis Israel Congregation in Washington, D.C., thus becoming the first president of the United States to actually be in a Jewish service. He went to their davening. Jews began to become active in politics. The first representative was Louis Charles Levin. Now, not surprisingly, his wife and daughter converted after his death. And David Levy Uli, who was the first governor of the great state of Florida, who also converted, after a short time, to the religion of his wife, Episcopalianism. Banking, the German Jews, were very successful bankers. They made the banking world. Right? In the middle of the 19th century, the German Jews invented investment banking in this country. Let's go through a few of the names. Goldman Sachs, founded by Samuel Sachs and Marcus Goldman. Kuhn and Loeb, or to Solomon Loeb, and his son-in-law, Jacob Schiff. Jacob Schiff was the Jewish leader in the beginning of the 20th century in America. His great-grandson, Nebuch, is married to Al Gore's daughter. <coughs> Dr. Schiff from New York, married to Al Gore's daughter. That's Jacob Schiff's great-grandson. Lehman Brothers, which were founded by Henry Emanuel and Mayor Lehman. Solomon Brothers, founded by Jules Bach. The Seligman family, which we came from the most powerful, they became, they became bankers. They financed the Panama Canal in the 1880s. By the 1890s, J. W. Sullivan and Company underwrote the securities of the stock and bond issues for the Railroad of America, for all of the steel and wire industries, and were heavily invested in Russia and Peru. And in fact, in 1910, when William C. Durant of General Motors Corporation was in debt, he gave the company over to Sullivan and Company for $15 million to rebuild the company. Beyond the Jewish investment bankers, who were all German, there are other famous German Jews, Joseph and Lyman Bloomingdale, founder of Bloomingdale's department store, the Warburgs, the Bambergers, the Morgan Fowles, August Belmont, Belmont Stakes, famous horse race, intermarried Jew, Neiman Marcus, all of the great department stores without exception almost, Neiman Marcus's, Macy's, Bloomingdale's, Kaufman, Saks Fifth Avenue's, Sears, and, ba and Barney's, were all founded or owned by German Jews. These are just a few, without exaggeration, a few of the famous names. Almost all of the great law firms in New York, or many of them, were founded by these Jews, as was much of the advertising and media of the paper industry, like the New York Times, founded by German Jews. Almost all of them, without exception, almost all of them, their descendants are Gentiles, including the owners of the New York Times, even Marcus, you name it, their descendants are no longer Jewish. The West Coast. Besides New York City, where did the German Jews go? German Jews settled in small towns throughout the South and West and become, became most prominent <coughs> in the Far West. Following the gold rush, in the California gold rush in 1849, German Jews established themselves in Portland, Oregon, Seattle, Washington, and especially San Francisco, California. San Francisco, which by the mid-19th century became the second largest Jewish city in the United States, about 8 to 10% of the population of San Francisco by the end of the 19th century was Jewish. 
would have a prominent Jewish presence. Two of the mayors in the 19th century were Jewish in San Francisco. And authors Eisenberg, Kahn, and Toll in their work, The Jews of the Pacific, which was published in 2009, an interesting book, emphasize that the creative freedom Jews found in the Western society, unburdening them from past traditions and opening up new opportunities for uh, entrepreneurship, philanthropy, and civic leadership. The most popular occupation was clothing merchants followed by small scale manufacturing and general retailing. Everyone was a newcomer to San Francisco. San Francisco in the mid 19th century was the most diverse city in the United States of America from the beginning. And the Jews were generally accepted with very few signs of discrimination. As mentioned, many Jews became politically active. Temple Emanuel, San Francisco, founded 1850. Downtown San Jose, founded 1861. Later, in the beginning of the 20th century, the largest population of the West Coast would move to Los Angeles. And the most dramatic cast of these newcomers would come to Hollywood. It is no exaggeration to say that the Jews invented the movie industry in the United States of America. American Jews built and dominated the movie industry, starting with Harry Kahn, who, is, uh, who built Columbia Pictures in 1924. He has Kahn to thank for, uh, or not to thank, for the Columbia Shorts featuring Moses, Jerome, and Larry uh, uh, and Larry, also known as Mo Curley and Larry Feinberg, the three students. The Horowitz's and the Feinbergs made these three students. Samuel Goldwyn, who was born Samuel Gelfish in the Varsaw, right? but we'll see that all the names have changed, partnered with Jesse Lasky, and they merged with Art of Zucker's famous plat players Lasky to found a studio which is today known as Paramount Studios. Then Goldwyn got in a fight with Zucker, sold his shares in 1917 for a million dollars, and with Charlie Chaplin, started another movie company called United Artists. Louis B. Mayer left Russia as a young boy in the 1880s. In 1924, the same year as Harry Kahn started Columbia, Louis B. Mayer started Metro, Goldman, and Mayer. All right? And he did this with someone called Marcus Lowy, also known as the Lowy's Movie Theaters, who was also owned by the theaters. Mayer was responsible for some of the greatest talent in, uh, I'm sure none of us know these people, but I'll say their names anyways, some of the greatest talent in Hollywood, including Greta Garbo, Errol Finn, John Barrymore, Gene Kelly, Spencer Tracy, Mickey Rooney, Judy Garland, and some Elizabeth Taylor, amongst many others. He said as follows, we are the only kind of company whose assets walk out the gate at night. The assets were their actors. William Fox, a Hungarian who, who came here in the early 19th century, founded Fox Film Corp, also known as 20th Century Fox. That's all of the major movie companies in Hollywood. Jews dominated the acting side as well. I'm going to go through some of the names and look how every single Yid, every single Jew changed their name. Eddie Cantor, also known as Edward Isaacovich. Al Jolson, Asa Jolson. The Marx Brothers, Groucho was really Julius. Chico, Leonard. Harpo, Adolf, and Zeppo was Herbert. Jack Benny was Benny Kowalski. Paul Muni was Muni Weissfund. Edward G. Robinson, okay, more gentle name than Edward G. Robinson. Or Edward was Emmanuel Goldenberg. John Garfield was Yankel Garfinkel. Danny Kay was Daniel Kamenisky. Lauren Bacco was Betty Pesky. Jerry Lewis, Yosef Levitch. <laughs> Tony Curtis, you think he's an Irishman? Bernie Schwartz. Bernie Schwartz, there you go. <laughs> Kirk Douglas, who's still alive. Isra Danilovich. Milton Berle, Milton Berliner. Mel Brooks, Melvin Kamenisky. George Burns, Nathan Birnbaum, I don't know how that went. <laughs> Lee J. Cobb, Lee Jacoby, I could have kept going, but I was, I was on a roll and I stopped. There's too many of them. Look at source number three. This is from Neil Garber, Gabler, An Empire of Their Own, How the Jews Invented Hollywood. The most striking similarity amongst Hollywood Jews wasn't their Eastern European origins. What united them in deep spiritual kinship 
was their utter and absolute rejection of their pasts and an equally absolute devotion to America. The Hollywood Jews embarked on an assimilation so ruthless and complete that they cut their lives to the pattern of American respectability as they interpreted it. But by its lights, the Jews were to be seen and not heard. The German Jews, of course, brought the reform movement to America. And the reform movement would now move to America, leaving Germany as its major home. And in America, the reform movement would go to new heights and new extremes. Of course, they built the largest reform temple in the United States of America, called Temple Emanuel, not in San Francisco, not in San Jose, but in New York City. By 1970, the 1970s, the majority of the board of Temple Emanuel was not halakhically Jewish, probably in all three places, but certainly in New York. By 1990s, it's, it's here as well. <clears throat> and by 1880, of the 200 synagogues in the United States of America, because of the German, the German Jews who came first, of the 200 synagogues, 180 of them were before, 90%. And in 1885, as I discussed previously in the, in the lecture reform, the reformed Jews of America under Kaufman Collar and Isaac Weiss had the Pittsburgh platform. And I'm going to read some of them. I know I mentioned it. It's good to review. We recognize the direct quotes from the platform. We recognize in Mosaic legislation a system of training the Jewish people <coughs> for its mission during its national life in Palestine. And today we accept its binding only its moral laws, no halakhic laws, and maintain only such ceremonies as elevate and sanctify our lives. We reject all such as are not adopted the views of habits of modern civilization, no prismila, no circumcision, you go down the list as I discussed with you before. We hold ourselves are no longer a nation, but a religious community, and therefore expect neither a return to Palestine, nor a sacrifice to worship under the sons of Aaron, nor the restoration of any of these laws concerning Jewish states. And therefore, as mentioned previously, the reform movement cut themselves off from any from any connection to the land of this, which why the reform until the night, late 1930s were rabid anti-Zionists. Emmanuel, both Emmanuel's Messiah posts did nothing for Zionism, and were probably anti-Zionism, all the way to the early 1940s. Interestingly enough, just to jump, the reform would change to an extent, partially because reform today has a lot of Eastern Europeans. And to them, the reform was a church. Remember, reform had reverence, they had Sunday service, no yama, because of course organs were a mainstay. And these Eastern Europeans were uncomfortable, and reform could not gain traction. So even radicals such as Kalf McCaller, by 1905, was no longer saying Sunday service, which was the norm. Sunday service was the norm for reform. And no longer um, only would they have no yama, because of that stayed in many of these places until much later. By 1937, in the Columbus platform, reform would reverse completely and embrace Zionism. That was largely because the reform movement was overpopulated by ex-conservative Jews, we'll get to conservative soon, and by Eastern European Jews. That changed the dynamic of German reform. Classic traditional German reform was no mitzvah observance. Not like you see reform today where they incorporate some mitzvah observance. No Zionism. No nationhood, that was what German reform was. That would change. Hebrew Union College, which was founded in Cincinnati by Isaac Merweis, who lived from 1819 to 1900. He was a German immigrant, and <coughs> he was the most, most profound, popular leader of reform, the reform movement, and he was actually slightly to the right of them. People like Einhorn from Baltimore were much more radical than Weiss. But at the first graduating rabbinic lunch, as, as mentioned, they had the Trefa banquet. What was it, the Trefa banquet for the rabbis, the clergymen? They served clams, soft shell crabs, shrimps, frogs legs, and a meat meal followed by ice cream. <laughs> what else would they have in an ordination? This so-called Trefa banquet so infuriated the more traditional Jews who thought that reform had gone too far, but were at the time willing to embrace orthodoxy, that they would find another alternative, another movement within Judaism. In 1886, 
these more traditional Jews, who were offended by the reform movement, found it an alternative to Hebrew Union College. It was called the Jewish Theological Seminary, and it became the bastion of the new purely American conservative movement. Now, as we'll get to in a few minutes, the conservative movement today is a hair's breadth away from reform. And if you read most sociologists, they're predicting that the conservative will merge into reform in the next 30 years. You can take it or leave it. But it's much closer to reform than orthodoxy. But in the, when the JTS was founded, it would be hard for many to distinguish between conservative and orthodoxy. There were, there were slight differences, slight differences at the time, which would change over the course of time. Look at source number four. It would first change with Solomon Schechter, who came from England, from Cambridge, England. He lived from 1850 to 1915. There's a whole 60, 70 schools in the country named after him. And in his new movement, which he, na he named his work the Catholic Israel. Now, the Catholic Israel is a very poor cha choice of a title. Catholic, though, he didn't mean Catholic. He meant universal Israel. Look at source number four. And here you can get the vibe by the first major leader of conservative America. It is not the mere more revealed Bible that is the first importance of the Jew, but the Bible as it repeats itself in history. In other words, as it is interpreted by tradition. Another consequence <coughs> of this conception of tradition is that neither scripture nor primitive Judaism, but general custom which forms the real rule of practice. Liberty was always given to the great teachers of every generation to make modifications and innovations in harmony with the spirit of existing in, in, in institutions. Hence, a return to mosaic, mosaic, mosaism, i.e. orthodoxy, would be illegal, pernicious, and indeed impossible. In other words, the conservative movement would uphold the word, Torah and the revealed word of God, but the interpretation would be up for grabs. This was a dramatic, from the beginning, departure from Torah Judaism, who always had an oral law, who held their established principles. And you can't just change things because things are in fact, or things are easy, or things are comfortable. And that the source for everything is not just the Bible, but the Talmud. That you can't say, if I feel today the Talmud's not valid, the Talmud's flexible. When the conservative movement left this pillar of literally dogmatic Judaism, dogmatic Judaism, it opened the door to a slippery slope and countless problems. The end result was that those who felt the reform had gone too far would end up slowly but surely coming closer and closer to reform themselves. Schachter himself, by the way, was not fully shot to Zerin. He publicly did and he publicly said there were three R's, because he had opposition, there were three R's in Judaism. Those three R's stood for rotten, ranting rabbis. Rotten, ranting rabbis. Conservative historians say that Schechter's successor, Cyrus Adler, shared his anti-clerical basis, bias. But the next chancellor of JTS, was really lauded by the reform. And who was this? This was Louis Finkelstein. I actually had one of his grandchildren as my professor at Penn. Completely unobservant. Um, <clears throat> for creating a new willingness in the JTS part to apply secular critical method to the study of Chumash. Under Finkelstein's guidance, in 1959, there was an essay competition for all of the JTS on the theme the traditions of Genesis from, from Parak Aleph, Pasak Aleph, from 1 1, all the way to Chaf He Yitzayim. Resemblances to dependencies upon and contrasts with the traditions of other peoples. And by 1970, Finkelstein had an advanced class in Bible in JTS with a description, promises, and analysis of the various sources, where the Bible got its sources from, not from God, other sources which were coming into the Bible. One of the results of Finkelstein's approach to the Bible and his tenure was that in the mid-1950s, conservatives changed the laws about lighting fire and started to allow 
driving. Of course, in the beginning, driving was only to synagogue and back. I don't know if they had a rule about purses and how many times you can beep your car, but I've been past a couple of conservative temples. Right? They don't just drive the temple anymore. It's on the way to the mall. You could beep the car. And that's long gone and driving is just the temple. But in the beginning, it's just the temple. Just the temple. Of course, a breach of biblical law, but just the temple. Finkelstein's wife actually saw this in Tradition Renewed, which was put out by the JTS themselves, by Ward Timer, who is the provost of JTS. His own wife entirely repudiated Judaism. It was not observant. And his own, this is in their own book, in his own attitude towards saving Jew, Jewish lives in Kukor This is a direct quote published by J.D. himself. The plight of ordinary Jews in Eastern Europe did not occupy Finkelstein's attention during the Holocaust. He did zero. He did zero for the Jews in the Holocaust. Zero. Right? And then in his tenure, Conservative was the largest movement in the United States of America, not orthodoxy, not reform. And he did zero. <clears throat> Gershon Cohen, who took over for Finkelstein, spent most of his career fighting for ordination of women. Originally, he was opposed. And now you're going to see how conservative works. He was opposed to ordination of women in the beginning. However, when they took a poll of conservative Judaism, the majority of conservative lay people wanted woman ordination. So Gershon Cohen reversed, and he decided that he wanted women's ordination. But he was had serious opposition. The serious opposition was an individual called Saul Lieberman, who was the head of the Talmud department at JTS, who was actually personally orthodox. What he was doing there is a big enigma. But he was the Talmud scholar. He was a product of Slavonka Yeshiva. He was rejected by his friends for being there. But he said he would leave. And he had another person called Weiss Halivni, who's still alive today, who also came into opposition, and they rallied the whole Ptolemy department of JTS against it. And for a while, Christian Khan could not get his plan. But time was on his side, because Saul Lieberman passed away. And when Saul Lieberman passed away, he had enough clout to do as follows. He made a committee of 14 people. This is how conservative law was decided. 14 people. Seven of them lay people, only one person from the Talmud staff of JTS. And he even said the following thing, he's going to ram down the commission's report, down the faculty's throats of women's ordination, and he was successful. They became women's rabbis. At the time, Hebrew University Chancellor Ellenson, who's today the chancellor, observed that the JTS has now ripped any last remnant that they had to their previous Orthodox connections from below them. Ismar Shorsh, who was a, now you have Arnie Eisen, who actually was in Stanford a while, for a while, as the head, but Ismar Shorsh, who was with the last, the previous one, he said in, in 1986 that there is almost no common denominator between the profession of a modern conservative rabbi and the religious leadership of the Middle Ages, i.e., conservative has nothing to do with the Rambam, nothing to do with Rashi, nothing to do with the Ramah. Nothing to do with the Shulchan Aruch. They have been ripped away to their own leaders from the, the, from the religious leadership of the Middle Ages. David Lieber, who is the president of the uh, of, of University of Judaism in Los Angeles, and the president of the International Association of Conservative Rabbis, confessed, I do not believe in the literal divine authorship of the Torah, and I do not believe the law and its details to be of divine origin. Probably the most famous JTS professor today is a guy named Neil Gilman. Okay, and he, Neil Gilman says as follows, the biblical account of Revelation is a classic myth. Torah then represents the canonical statement of our myth. Look at source number four. Source number four is probably one of the more famous conservative clergymen, Howard, Harold Kushner. You know Source five. Oh, thank you. So much. It says as follows: Is the conservative movement halakhic? Not should it be halakhic? Not would the world be better? Would my job be easier, more gratifying if it were? But is it? And the answer is that it obviously is not. It is not halakhic. Conservatives are not halakhic, and increasingly, even conservative rabbis 
are not halachic. Even concerned, I remember I taught for Asia Torah in Philadelphia for a while, and in Philadelphia, the probably the last 15, 20 years, that a couple, 200, 200 families became from the conservative movement to Orthodox. So one of the conservative, ex-conservatives, now the president of the Jewish Day School there, is a very, very successful Orthodox individual today, when he first came over, he told me, he said, Rabbi, there's no such thing as conservative Jews. There's only conservative rabbis. No, no conservative Jew follows what they say. There's only conservative rabbis. I, would, I didn't know at the time, but afterwards I researched. This thing is conservative rabbis. They themselves don't hold conservative, what the original conservative is. The conservative movement today, you can see the beginnings of people who left Nisora, people who have no tradition. Over the past 10 years, the conservative movement has lost 200 synagogues. 25 years ago, the issue in the conservative movement was how the rabbi in the synagogue should deal with the spouse of intermarried couples. Right? Could the, the, the Jewish spouse be a member? Could the Jewish spouse be called up to Torah? That was 25 years ago. Today, the overwhelming majority of young conservative Jews believe intermarriage is okay as long as the kids are somehow miraculously raised Jewish. It's so much so that a bunch of the West Coast, from the, from the Bay Area and the LA, of conservative clergymen, wrote a small book called A Place in the Tent. It takes a very liberal approach to interreach intermarried couples, and they say you shouldn't call non-Jewish spouses, non-Jews, call them, this is the language, Karavli Yisrael. Karavli, close to Jews. They're not non-Jews, they're close to Jews, because they're married to, they're Karavli Yisrael. Right? This modernizing of the conservative movement is not only noticeable on the intermarriage, but also on their ordination of gays and lesbians, and regarding same-sex marriage, and obviously biblical injunctions as well. One very recent study found that amongst conservative Jewry, 4% every year rediscover orthodoxy, 13% move to reform, 35% drop all Jewish affiliations. Another found that 37% of conservative Jews intermarry, and that includes all of conservative Judaism. The number is considerably higher amongst conservative Jews under the age of 40. So, this was the background when the Russian, Romanian Jews came to the country in the 1880s. Now, if you remember, <coughs> going way back, when the Babylonia, actually, I discussed this, not here, but in the previous uh, setting, when in Babylonia the Jews were exiled, before Nebuchadnezzar took the mass of the Jews, he actually took 10,000 Jewish scholars, students, tzaddik, and the righteous amongst them, amongst Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, great people, Mordechai, they were all talking years before the Babylonian Jews were, were exiled into the first temple to Babylonia. So when the masses of Jews came to Babylonia after the destruction of the first temple, the Jews who had beat them there were very observant, very pious, and there was an infrastructure. Between 1880 and 1914, over two million Yiddish-speaking Yidin Jews came to this country from Eastern Europe, from Russia, the Pale Center, which we said last week, included Poland, Lithuania, Belarus, Ukraine, Moldova, and Romania. Huh? Galicia. Galicia, wherever. Right. There, they had been beat by 270,000 German Reform Jews. The establishment in the United States of America was reformed, and that's what greeted them when they came to this country. Moreover, there were Sunday laws, which meant that you could not work on Sunday. And if you were an immigrant, and when all of these Jews that came here were very poor, it came actually in a period of mass immigration during the Industrial Revolution, so they did not have the upper mobility of the German Jews, nor did they have the education of the German Jews, because German Jewry, as mentioned previously, had been emancipated way before the Russian Jews. They were university trained. The Russian Jews were not allowed to go to university. When these Russian and Romanian and Poland Jews, Polish Jews came here in the 1880s and 1990s, they came with no education. They came with no money. And the law of the land in most municipalities that you could not work on Sunday. Well, guess what happens when you have a garment industry which is trying to make money? They work six days a week. 
And if Sunday you cannot work, that means you work on Saturday. And if you didn't work on Saturday, likelihood was you were going to come back on Monday. So Mori managed used to come to Sabbath observance. Moreover, there was no money for Jewish education, nor were there any Jewish schools. So you had people who were traditional Jews sending their children in mass to Jewish public schools, what I call Jewish public schools, because if you had lived in Brownsville or in East Flatbush or in Bedford Stuyvesant or at the time Harlem was Jewish or certainly the Lower East Side, 95% of the public school was Jewish. But they had no Jewish education. They never learned Talmud. And it was the great melting pot of America where the pressure was to fit in. For this reason, many of the great rabbis of Europe, first and foremost, the Chavetz Chaim, strongly came against immigration to America. They called it the trade from Medina. Because the only thing the Jews had to lose when they came here was their Yiddish kite. And they lost it in mass. Right? Many of the traditional Jews who came here, their children and their grandchildren were not uh, Jewish. The Al Jolsons of the world, that was a story. The, the, the jazz singers of the world, the Al Jolson who comes and the grandson who, uh, or the son of the cantor, well, that was a story of many of these Jews. What about anti-Semitism? As immigration increased by 1848, there were 50,000 German Jews. In popular culture, they were began to get small vibes of anti-Semitism. There were no pogroms, like in Europe, but there was social isolation and other types of discrimination. As mentioned, in 1843, B'nai B'rith started. You know why B'nai B'rith started? Well, the, there were a dozen young German Jews who applied to get into the Old Fellows Lodge. The Old Fellows Lodge. You know, it's like an old man's club. When these nice Jewish boys try to play golf, I don't play golf, cricket probably in those days, in the Old Fellows Lodge, they were rejected because they were Hebrews. They then started their own lodge called B'nai B'rith. Joseph Seligman, the rich banker, I mentioned before, well, he was refu refused a hotel accommodations in 1869, one of the richest people in America, at Saratoga Springs, starting a national scandal, but the owner, a guy named Hilton, didn't let him in. In 1894, just for an example, when the anti-immigration sentiment began to raise in this country, Henry Adams, a grandson of John Quincy Adams, and a great a descendant of John Adams, he organized the Immigration Restriction League. And first and foremost of the people he wanted to restrict from immigrating to this country, and this is his own words in the education of Henry Adams, he wrote, not a Polish Jew fresh from, from Warsaw or Krakow, not a furtive fur Jacob or Yitzchak, Yitzchak, I don't know how to spell, still reeking of the ghetto, snarling a weird Yiddish to the officers of customs. He lost, even though he was very popular at the time, and the, the, the next <coughs> and first Jew to be appointed to cab the cabinet was Oscar Strauss, the brother of Nathan Strauss and Isidore Strauss, the founder of Macy's. He was the first Jew in cabinet, and he was actually the Secretary of Commerce and Labor in 1906, who was in charge of immigration. So, but over time, we'll see what things would change. In 1913, a Jew in Atlanta named Leo Frank was falsely convicted for the rape and, and murder of Mary Fagan. <coughs> A 13-year-old Christian girl in his employ, he was sentenced to death by Governor uh, Slayton, then reviewed, and his, it was commuted to life imprisonment. But due to the public outrage, a mob broke into the prison and lynched Leo Frank. He was, many years later, pardoned completely, but the evidence came out that he was certainly not guilty. But in response to the lynching of Leo Frank, Sigmund, Sigmund Livingston, founded the Anti-Defamation League, the ADL, under the sponsorship at the time of B'nai B'rith. The ADL, of course, became the leading Jewish group fighting anti-Semitism. But as the masses of Jews came in between 1880 and 1914, it did create an anti-immigrant sentiment, especially because the Jews weren't the only Eastern Europeans com coming. There were others as well. And previously, all of the immigration to America happened from Western Europe, in Southern Europe, from Italy, from Ireland, and from Germany, not from Poland and Russia. And over time, the anti-immigrants actually won. And by the Emergency Quota Act of 1921, they established immigration restrictions specifically targeting Eastern European Jewry. And the great 
the U European um, immigration to America ended, which of course had horrible, horrible consequences during the years of the 1930s, Hitler, and certainly during the Holocaust. These Eastern European Jews, when they abandoned their Yiddishkeit, when they did the proverbial, they threw the tefillin into the sea, so the traditionals and the socialists among them became very left wing. They became, they embraced the liberal policies in America. Certainly the most popular periodicals in the Northeast in the 1920s and 30s <coughs> were the Morgan, the Morgan Freer, the Morgan Journal, and the Forward, left wing organizations such as the Arbiter Ring and the Jewish. People's fraternal order played an important part in Jewish community life. Jewish Americans were involved in every progressive cause, and they were the leaders of most of them. They promoted civil, promoted civil rights, workers' rights, freedom of religion, peace movements, and they founded the labor movements. Of course, most popular and famous of them all is Samuel Gompers, who built the AFL, American Federation of Labor, and Sidney Holman, who was the head of the Congress of industrial organization, the CIO, of course, today, as of 1955, the AFL and CIO were merged, and they're the largest powerful union. We can't even imagine it today because they've lost a lot of their clout, mostly because some of their policies actually induced jobs to leave overseas, if you ask me. But in the 1930s and 40s and 50s, these were very, very powerful organizations, especially during FDR's New Deal. And the Jews, Originally, in the 19th century, German Jews leaned Republican. The Jews became overwhelmingly Democrat, so much so that in the elections of Roosevelt in 1936 and 1940 and 1944, he got between 95 and 97% of the Jewish vote. Truman himself got 90% of the Jewish vote, despite the platform of 48 being both the Democrats and the Republicans supporting the establishment of a state of Israel. He still got over 90% of the Jewish vote. The Jews were the heads. This is hard to believe today because you look at frayed jewish back relations, but the Jews were the heads of the civil rights movement. There was a famous movie in Mississippi Burning. And the, you know the students who were killed, they were Jews. They were Jewish students. Well, the most responsible funder of the civil rights movement was Julius Rosenwald. Julius Rosenwald was the half-owner and builder of Sears Roebuck. He was a German Jew. R R Rosen Rosenwald established the Rosenwald Foundation, and with Booker T. Washington, he funded 5,357 public schools for blacks in the Deep South. He personally founded, funded one-third of the public schools for blacks in the Deep South. He was the major contributor to the NAACP, he was on the board of all Washington's organizations, the National Urban League. He also made major contributions as a hall, a Rosenwald Hall, the University of Chicago. He built the Chicago Museum of Science and uh, gave the Jewish philosophy as well. Jews were amongst the leaders in the 1960s. Um, the two major iconic marches in the 1960s, Joachim Prince, who was the president of the American Jewish Congress, he was in the March of Washington and he was a speaker before. Martin Luther King's famous I Have a Dream speech. And he said, as Jews we bring to this great demonstration which thousands of us proudly participate, a twofold experience, one of spirits and one of history. Two years later, in the famous Selma to Montgomery march, if you look at the pictures of those marching on the front line with Martin Luther King, is Abraham Heschel um, himself. This would change in the mid-1960s with Malcolm X, and Black Power, the Black Panthers, there would be a backlash in Black Jewish relations. But as the Jews went to the 21st century, the success of the German Jews spread to the Russian Jews as well. The Russian Jews moved out of the Lower East Side and they left Brownsville and East Flatbush and Bedford Stuyvesant, and they were upward mobile. Right, 45 percent of the Forbes, uh, 40, top 40, not the 400. 45% of the top 40 in the 1990s into the 2000s were Jewish. 45% of the 40th richest people of the country are Jewish, or 2% of the population. 40% of the partners in the leading law firms in New York and Washington, D.C. are Jewish. 30% of the American Nobel Prize winners in science. And 37% of all American Nobel Prize winners are Jewish. And the Ivy Leagues, including the University of Pennsylvania, average over 30% 
of Jewish students. But with the success, remember right from the beginning, the jazz singer, Jews would be successful at integration and success at this, in this country, but they would be dismal in Jewish identity, dismal in maintaining their Judaism. Right? Since 1960, the Jewish population has shrunk. In America, population that's doubled, the Jewish population has shrunk. So much so that by 1990, in 2000, they actually did not do a 2010 Jewish census. And that's for good reason. They're scared to do it. Right? By the 1990s, Alan Dershowitz wrote a famous book based on the 1990 Jewish census called The Vanishing Jew, where he writes explicitly, let's take the orthodox out of the equation. We are disappearing. And he says that ultimately, with all of their success, and he's not an observant Jew, Judaism is a simile. And he saw it himself because his own son intermarried at Harvard. What about the Orthodox? For a long time, what we call Orthodoxy in this country was in decline. Holding on to the elements constantly in the rear guard, by right, losing its youth because they had no education, I never, coming to a country where they had no infrastructure, forced to work, work on the Sabbath. I, they're the poor ones supported by the rich German Jews, and they're lost, lost in numbers. Marshall Sklar, who was the eminent Jewish sociologist in the 1950s, the dean of American Jewish sociology, declared regarding Orthodox in the mid-1950s that the history of their movement in this country can be written in terms of a case study of institutional decay and then predicted that within 50 years the Orthodox would disappear. And he was not alone in the 1950s in imagining there would be no more Orthodox Jews in the United States of America. In Chicago alone in the 1950s, 50 Orthodox synagogues converted to conservative. It did not look good for Orthodoxy. If you would be a betting man, you would say that in 2010, maybe you'll have a few Hungarian Jews left in Williamsburg, Maybe you'll have a couple of Jews, but there'll be, no, there'll be no children. Orthodox was the, was the religion of the old Europeans who came over. The Zaydas and the Bobbies. I once remember talking to uh, you know, an elder Jew who was, Thomas, who was, who was all, all his descendants had intermarried. All his descendants. He saw his grandfather who came over from Europe. <laughs> he was the Bob and the Zaydas. They were, they were religious. He's not alone. <laughs> that story is not unique. The Bobbies and Zaydas from way back. The traditional filler in the roof. There were, there were the Jews. The numerous predictions in the 1940s and the 50s of Orthodox disappearing were wrong. By 2001, by 2001, Orthodox Jews they had the highest percentage of, Jew, of Jewish children amongst. In fact, today, under 25, Orthodox Jews are by far the highest denomination. That is because in their pockets of concentration, the numerical growth is mind-boggling. It is, un, it is the, the fastest growing city, by the way, of this 2010 census, is a little town called Curious Joel in New York, which is a Satmar enclave. The next fastest growing part in the United States of America is something called Borough Park. Right? The Orthodox, now, don't get me wrong, I'm not, the Orthodox was not utopia. <laughs> there is attrition. There are problems. But the problems mostly are sociological in nature, financial, other issues dealing with certain modern technology. They're not theological. In orthodoxy, every 10 years, the numbers are growing and growing and growing. Right? There are over 200,000 students in New York and New Jersey in, in day schools. 90% of the day schools are orthodox. Who changed what orthodoxy is in America, because if you look in 2010, the under 25 population, the most, I actually was reading, um, if anyone wants to read this, I, I, I saw on the web, the AJC, American Jewish Congress, uh, put out by David Harris and Stephen Bond in 2010, it's about 220 pages, I read it, it's fascinating. When Stephen Cohen, who's from Hebrew in college, said that within 40 years, over 50% of institutional Judaism will be Orthodox. Over 50% of institutional Judaism will be Orthodox. I mean, the, the, the numbers are mind-boggling. Right? If you look under uh, who's under 25 who's Jewish, who's marrying Jews, 
whose kids are, be, who are becoming or, or, or are staying Jews. It's almost all of it. Why is that? Why is that? They were because of a few rabbis. <coughs> the first, actually, I had a tragic end, was by Jacob Joseph, who came from Vilna in 1887 and became the first and only chief rabbi of New York. He came again under a tr- tremendous opposition, but he started to establish policies as far as kashras. There's a famous yeshiva called RJJ that branches in Staten <coughs> Island and Edison today, who was for many years in the Lower East Side, which is named after him. Later, due to the communists, 1936, Rabbi Moshe Feinstein comes to the shores of this country. Rabbi Feinstein becomes the posik, the halachic decisor of the world. He becomes the greatest. You had now, not in Europe, but in America, the greatest posik. Rabbi Eliezer Silver, who also in Cape Nola, became the head of the Orthodox rabbinate. Agurus Rabban, he was a primary disciple of Chaim Ozer Brzezinski, who was the greatest sage of Eastern Europe. Rabbi Shraga Fahim Mandelavitz, who became the Rosh Hashiva in Torah Vedas. He built something called Torah Masora. Torah Masora today has 800 Jewish day schools. When he became, started Torah Masora in 1944, there was Jewish education stopped in Brooklyn. And there was very little of it in Brooklyn. But he had a dream and he had a vision to build Jewish day schools throughout the country. I can tell you that I went to a Jewish day school in my youth called Hebrew Academy in Miami Beach. That was built in 1949 by one of his students, Alexander S. Gross, <coughs> Rabbi Alexander S. Gross, who went to Florida and went driving from one neighborhood to the other, picking up kids to give them a Jewish education. That institution itself has had thousands, if not 10, over 10,000 students, go through its doors and change all of South Florida. Because all of the yeshivas and schools and Population came after that school. There would have been nothing there. South Peninsula, by the way, the term of service school. Rabbi Cutler, who fe- came to this country and changed all of America, who founded Lakewood Yeshiva in 1943 with 14 students. In 1943. Today the Yeshiva has over 6,000 students. And is the largest, most, and Lakewood itself has 70,000 Orthodox Jews. <coughs> who came to this country and came to San Francisco. And you know what the first thing Rabbi Aaron Kadler said in San Francisco is? That we have a Masoro, we have, an ex- we have a Kabbalah for Rabbi Chaim Volozhin, who was the primary disciple of Vilma Goyim, that the last stanza, the last home, the last station of Torah in the exile will be America. When he said that in 1943, there was nobody studying Torah in the whole country, Kanat. Almost nobody. There were a few yeshiva students. The last station of Torah? America? The trade from Medina? While in Hollywood, they were building movie theaters. And while in New York, Temple Emanuel was the biggest, strongest synagogue. Who would have thought in America in 1943 when, when all sociologists were saying orthodoxy is history? It's the old country. You know, the roof, they said goodbye. Shalom Aleichem. Good to see you later. Who could have imagined? that America would have a yeshiva, a lake with yeshiva with 6,000 students in 1943. Rabbi Moshe Soloveitchik and Rabbi Yosheber Soloveitchik who went to Yeshiva University, they themselves influenced tens of thousands of Jews in the modern Orthodox world. Sunar of Soloveitchik was one of the great thinkers of the 20th century and affected many, many Jews who were on, on the cusp, who could have left the fold. He was a very, very influential person. Rabbi Ruderman, it's a of Ruderman who founded the Yisrael Yeshiva, which is the second or third largest yeshiva in America, who when he started a yeshiva in Baltimore called Nair Israel, they threw tomatoes at him. They laughed at him. What are you starting yeshiva? This is not uh, Lithuania. Rav Hutner, who started yeshiva in Berlin, and of course Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky, who with Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, after the death of Rabbi Aaron Cutler, led American Jewry. There was Satmer Rebbe, who came after the Holocaust, who built insular communities, who have now tens and tens of thousands of followers, growing at disproportional rates. There is, of course, Lubavitch Rebbe, who is not insular, who spread outreach, and who is not a Jew. I don't care how assimilated you are, who hasn't heard of Chabad. It's, it's unbelievable. Every Jew heard of Chabad. Who doesn't? You can meet a Jew anywhere. Chabad they heard of. It was the Baba Varebo. All of most of Borough Park is Baba. Borough had, had 
He came to America, the few students in Manhattan, a little, a little out of tens of thousands of people in Borough Park, or a bubble. That Chaim Velazhin, that America will be the last station of Toto, they say a story that when Chaim Velazhin was once giving class, he was once giving Shir and Velazhin again, as I mentioned, the last lecture was the great yeshiva of Europe. It was the mother of all yeshivas. And Chaim Velazhin was the Rosh Hashiva, Rosh Hashivas. And he was giving Shir one day. And he started, he started to cry. Then he laughed at the end. And the Nachlis Dover, Dover Tevel, was his great student. He said, Rebbe, what are you doing? He said, I, you know, I look at America and I see it's going to be the last station of Taiwan. This is, by the way, when Indians are running around this country. Early, early 19th century. You know, the German Jews hadn't even come yet. I see that America is going to be the last stanza. You have to imagine... 6,000 Jews in the country, he's saying it's the last station of Torah. In Europe at the time had millions of Jews. Eastern Europe was almost all religious. 18 to 1810, 18 to whatever it was. America would be the last stanza of Torah. Who would have thought? He said, Rabbi, so why are you crying? He said, because I see it will come at, a, at, a, at an awful cost. It will come at an awful cost. Because the golden Medina of America has been a Medina where millions of Jews have lost their Judaism. And in our generation, millions more are at risk every day. You can read the, read the, read the read, don't even read the San Jose Mercury News, read the J News. <laughs> You'll see the internet. Read the Jewish News. You read the San Jose Read the JCN. You can, now J Valley, they changed it. You can see the intermarriage. Hey, you look around the whole country, and all the people who will be left are those who are connected to Torah. Because ultimately speaking, the Jewish people. The Jewish people are our nation of Torah. And when we go by the laws of nature, we disappear. But a Jew is connected to Torah, is connected to the infinite. And if you look in the history of the Jewish people, wherever country you go to, wherever place you go, Jews who are connected to Torah, and they may go through ter- periods of travail, but ultimately they last as Jews. Jews who disconnect from Torah, disconnect from Torah, and Rahmanis, are lost over time. The next lecture, and I actually changed the title, because it was originally supposed to be the Holocaust and the new anti-Semitism. And I thought to myself that the new anti-Semitism I really dealt with, I dealt with the Enlightenment. And the Holocaust, you know, I, the, everyone knows the Holocaust. I mean, the Holocaust is probably one of the most read pieces of Jewish history today. I mean, the Holocaust literature is abundant. So I'm changing the title to Communism, Nazism, and the Destruction of European Jewry. Thank you. Thank uh-huh.